Welcome. I am Julie Sedenko here with Marie. She is an independent entrepreneurial European who's worked all over the East Coast of the United States as a missions videographer. She's also the mom of one sweet little boy. Well, I think he's sweet little boy. <laughs> uh, she's now divorced after 11 years of marriage and living a life of a single mom. Marie, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It, uh, you were in a very controlling marriage and honestly felt a little crazy because of the deceit that you experienced. In fact, I couldn't believe when I read that the lies began on your very first date. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, we had basically met in church and uh, we connected and really hit it off. And by the end of the month, uh, we started dating officially. And he told me some things on that date, uh, which I keep a journal and I have done for a long period of time. So I had written down in the journal some of the things that he told me. And uh, when I had filed for the divorce and we were going through the separation stage, I went back and I remembered the date that we had started dating. And I went back and I looked at that that day and I looked at what I'd written. And I noticed that there were three things that I could pick out that were lies that he told me right from the very start. And one of those included his age. And the reason why that came up was because he's from Africa. And mm -hmm. he managed to convince me that they didn't have birth certificates at the time when he was born and they didn't, you know, have those kind of records. And the birth date on his passport was wrong. And it ultimately he convinced me and other people that he was nine years younger than he actually is. That's kind of scary. I mean, did he not yeah. think that you're going to figure that out eventually? <laughs> well, you would think, you know, um, but he actually, when we were on our honeymoon, uh, he went and he got himself a birth certificate, which said that he was nine years younger. He wouldn't allow oh, me to go did? with him. Yeah, he wouldn't allow me to go with him to actually get this. But he and his brother went to the city and they actually managed to get a birth certificate that uh, that said that he was nine years younger. Wow, I might have him do that for me. <laughs> there were a lot of lies that you didn't find out until much, much later. What were some of the lies that you found out after the divorce had, or during the divorce that had taken place? Um, so after we separated, I decided to contact the first wife because he had been married before. And I reached out and said, would it be okay to talk? And she came over and we had it conversation I just asked her um, could you tell me your story like I didn't want to put anything on her I didn't want to say anything to kind of say which way the story should go so I just asked can you tell me how you met you know how you came to be in this situation and she told her story and it was familiar enough to know that my husband had kind of said some of the things that were like I, I could recognize it but my husband had twisted it in such a way as to be favorable to him. So for example, he would say that he left Africa on a scholarship um, to study medicine, whereas he actually met his wife who then brought him over and his wife got him the job at the hospital where he was working. So it was very much a puffed up story that he told of how amazing he was in effect um, that he was so privileged to be able to come to this country as a scholarship from from his country, um, whereas actually that wasn't wasn't true at all. And of course, his age. He, I mentioned that already, um, and the situation with his kids. He had said that he wasn't allowed to see his kids, and his his wife actually said he, she made every opportunity for him to have contact with the kids, and he didn't follow up on it. So the fact that he's now not following up with our son isn't entirely surprising um plus all throughout the marriage there were lots of little things which just didn't add up and didn't make sense and i was just like that doesn't hmm. really make sense and then sometimes if i brought it up he would say that um he would say something to try and convince me that it did make sense and sometimes i'd be like mm, okay but a lot of times it was just like I, I i felt like he was lying so many times i didn't know what to believe in the end it was like i couldn't believe anything you also experienced a lot of fear in your marriage. Talk about some of the things that were happening that were pretty scary. 
a lot of the things that became more scary um, later on in the marriage, initially it was more um, subtle things, which I, I wasn't even able to say was abuse at the time. But um, there were things like he had a machete beside the bed and he told me that was to protect me from intruders. And I thought that was a bit weird, but maybe it was an African thing. I don't know. <laughs> um, and then when I got pregnant, I went and stayed with my sister because it was right over Christmas. So we stayed overnight with her. And when I came back, there was a knife beside the bed. And I was like, what's this knife here for? <laughs> um, and I guess because of the way that I had kind of been trained over the years to kind of minimize things and downplay stuff, I just picked up the knife and I hit it. And I was like, not thinking through why would it be there? And um, that, that didn't end up going anywhere with that, but it was like just these, these little hints of threats. Um, he actually made a verbal threat because I asked him once, like, why why wouldn't you forgive me? Why wouldn't you talk to me? And things like that. And um, this was not really for anything that I needed forgiving for, but I would always be like, you know, taking everything as being my responsibility. And I would say sorry for anything. And he said, um, I'm going to make some changes around here. They're going to be painful. May God help you. <gasps> and, and these kind of threats. Um, and I was just like, what is that? What do I do with that? What are you going to do? And did you ask all, him that? I did. I did. And he said, you'll have to find out kind of thing. He wasn't going to tell me. He never did. So it was this subtle kind of like I'm living in fear, like, what is he going to do? And if I upset things, what's he going to do? And um, if I asked for forgiveness, he would say things like, it's too late now. And I'm like, how is it too late? <laughs> what happened to God's forgiveness? What what kinds of things were you needing to ask forgiveness for? Um, one of the things I remember keenly was actually related to that uh, phrase that he used. And that was because I messaged his friend saying that he did not want to come and get ice cream with me on my birthday. And because I phrased it, that he did not want to come, he got really, really cross with me because he said he couldn't come because he had a bad back. And because I phrased it wrong to his friend, he got really angry with me. And I was like, sorry that I phrased it wrong. I didn't mean it to be that big of a problem. Like it was just um, letting him know that you didn't want to come. You could add, you know, didn't want to come because of a bad back. I just didn't add that bit. And these kind of dynamics happened a lot where you were apologizing? Yes. There was a lot of gaslighting that happened in your marriage, things where places where he would twist things that even though they were his fault, he made it look like your fault. Can you describe some instances where this happened? Because I know, I know it's happening to a lot of other ladies. Yeah. Um, often uh, we would have conversations at dinner. Well, actually, a lot of dinners were completely silent. But um, if we had a conversation, uh, especially if it was more of an important one where we're trying to sort things out, I would find that he would, he, the way he would talk would be very confusing to me. And I would be, it would be like going around in circles. Um, I wouldn't quite understand where he was coming from on something or he would be reflecting his own behavior on me so that he was accusing me of the things that he was actually doing. And okay. I, I would sometimes go to bed at night thinking like after this conversation at dinner and I'd be like, what just happened? And I'd be trying to process through and it might take me a day or two to really filter through everything that happened and then actually have a more realistic view of those, those circumstances. And then I'd have to go back and kind of address those with him again. And then it would be this back and forth and I'd, I'd get accused of things that, I never did um and i'm like well you know i wasn't even there to be able to do whatever it was that you said that i'm accused of you know and but facts didn't matter no even if you would say look i wasn't even there he yeah. he couldn't apologize and acknowledge oh yeah you weren't or it, no. that didn't happen so no he would um for example there was one time he had this big filing cabinet full of I don't know what, but he had a key. So I was never allowed access to it. And he accused me of getting into his filing cabinet and moving things around. And I'm like, I don't have the key to get into your filing cabinet. So how could I have actually done that? And yeah, he, he never really took that back. He would always just, just blame me for everything that went wrong or that he see, that he viewed as being an issue. 
Control was a big thing with him, wasn't it? It was. But it was very subtle. He wasn't very domineering in personality. He was quite, um, in some ways, he was kind of a timid guy. Uh, really? He, he, di he didn't come across as very domineering in his uh, persona and his presence. But it was this kind of subtle, I say subtle, but it was more like... Um, was it passive aggressive? Yes, yeah. So it was it was there, but it was very well, like it, nobody else would have known necessarily what was going on because he just came across as this really nice guy and gentle person and came across, when I got to know him, he came across as humble and he wouldn't shout at me, but he would use his words to kind of wind me up and get to the point where I'm then reacting and I'm the one that looks bad, but he's almost got this smirk on his face, kind of loving the idea of me feeling worse and worse. Um, and yeah, there was one time I was like, he's enjoying this. And he's just like talking very calmly. Um, but the words, the words he was saying was just there. He knew how to push my buttons. And even when I told him to stop and I would tell him to stop multiple times, he just kept on going. Yeah. Oh, friend, have you been there? <laughs> have you been in a place where you feel like you're going crazy and you act crazy and you see this smirk on their face and it's almost like they're enjoying it. And then you start to feel this guilt of maybe it is me. Maybe I'm the bad one. I think I've been there. I know so many others have been there. Uh, if you've been there, I think Marie's saying you're not alone. <laughs> How did you feel, Marie, when you would go to bed at night after an incident like that? what were your thoughts toward yourself? So one of the things I feel like is a huge value of mine is to, um, you know, the Bible says that we need to uh, be willing to say that we're sorry. So whenever I was wound up and I had reacted badly, I then felt guilty, you know, and felt convicted that I need to be the one that to apologize, at least for my part, because, you know, there were times when I would react in such a way that I was like, I, I do actually need to say sorry for that. But then it felt really bad because I'm like, he was the one that, made pushed me to the point of um for example one time I threw a glass of water at him and I was like well that's not okay you know it might right. have been, <laughs> it might have been good it felt good at the time but it wasn't the right thing to do and I felt convicted that you know I had to to say sorry and I felt bad about that like having to do that but I would do it and then I would go to bed and I would just feel like this is so unfair and, and you know he's just because I'm going to guess he accepted your apology, but there was no reciprocal. No, he didn't. He didn't reciprocate at all. So, yeah, it was always it's always me that was at fault. And I I would always just feel like I never to, to start with, at least um, it was always felt like I would never um, never be enough. Like when we first got back from our honeymoon, it, it, it started right from the beginning. And I felt like I had to earn his love back because he would, I, I would give him a hug and he would just stand there straight. And I'm like, we just got back from a honeymoon. You don't just stand there and not hug your wife back. And there were little things like that, um, which then built up over time that made me feel like I, you know, what was wrong? What was I not doing? Why was he treating me the way he was? And, you know, kind of making me basically whittling me down and my my confidence in myself mm -hmm. and getting me to the point where I was a shell of myself um eventually you know after a period of time I got to the point where I was suicidal I didn't want to be alive anymore I did you know if it wasn't a case of in my life I wanted to run away and not be known by anybody like I wanted to just leave my life and mm. and um yeah I got to that point where I nearly went through with it and and a little while afterwards I got a tattoo on my wrist which says Jeremiah 2911 oh. with a cross underneath and it's just a little reminder for me that you know if I ever get to that place again which I don't think I will but if I ever did then I've got that reminder that God has good plans for me and even in the midst of a really dark situation and stuff that we can hold on to that hope. Marie tell me about that moment or that day Take me back there because my fear is that someone listening may be in that place or maybe close to that place. And what were your thoughts? What was going on? 
and why did you feel like that was the only way out? So we had been married not quite three years. It was about three or four months shy of that. And I had been getting, I've been feeling quite depressed for quite some time. And I had got to the point where I was, you know, really, really, really struggling. And he dismissed me, like dismissed my feelings about the situation that we um, were dealing with. And I just felt like I didn't matter anymore. And during that conversation that we were having, I just felt like something snapped inside me. And it was almost like I went into this kind of um, automation. It's like almost like not, not myself anymore. I was just kind of just, I just picked up my things and I walked upstairs and I was just kind of like in this zone, like not really with it anymore. And I was just like, I can't do this anymore. This is, this is it, I, I just can't do it. And, and I remember writing a note and the first note I wrote was so shaky, I couldn't even, <laughs> you know, it wasn't making sense. So I, I tried again and, and I was able to do it. And, and I started gathering my supplies of what I was gonna do. And then um, I just felt like so desperate and I didn't let my parents know or my sisters, um, they would have been devastated if they'd know. And I just remember sitting in this bed, actually it's not this bed anymore, but um, just lying in bed uh, right before I was gonna go through and I just felt this sense of God's presence with me like he was actually standing physically in the room he, I couldn't see it or anything but it was like that physical presence and just verse after verse after verse came to mind reminding me that I'm God's child that God loves me God's got a purpose for me plan for me got a hope and a future and not to go through it reminding me that my family are there they love me and all these things and I ended up just getting rid of the the notes and putting everything away and just going to sleep and, and carrying on just as well as I could for, from then on. But I got to that Thank point where God. I literally, I, I, I feel like Jesus, I don't know if it was Jesus or an angel or what, but it was that real tangible presence I'll never forget. Thank God. Mm. Thank God. What a horrible place to be. This is what bothers me so much sometimes with this teaching with the church they would rather you leave a marriage that way than divorce. Mm -hmm. Divorce is so anathema that it's okay for a woman to become literally suicidal. Just don't leave your marriage. And how that could possibly be the heart of God, uh, it's not. And his heart was there with you that night and I'm so thankful. Mm -hmm. uh, your husband would use suicide as well as a means of controlling you. Describe that. Yeah, so my husband would also um, be depressive as well. And he would often say that he was feeling suicidal. He would sometimes call the suicide hotline. He would sometimes come home late. And there was one time in particular where he was home like two hours late or something like that. And I was like, what's going on? And I, at that time, I was not as educated <laughs> and I was panicking and I was like what's going on where is he and he came and walked in through the door and he was kind of like this far away gaze kind of like and I thought oh something something's bad happened or something um but then it would continue and he kept saying it and kept saying it and I'm like you know what I'm not sure if he actually is or if he's just saying it because I know that when I was feeling that way I didn't actually let anybody know um right. I was trying to push through and trying to trying to keep going I wasn't using it as a tech you know something that I would throw out when it felt convenient so I actually got to the point where I was like I actually don't believe that anymore I believe that it was just another control tactic to get me to be submissive and to be like oh you know what, what can I do differently and and to, to be there for him in, in the way that he wanted rather than to bring things up or whatever it might be. So it was a way to keep me, keep me down and to keep me quiet and to be the, the nice Christian girl that he wanted to, to look after him kind of thing. He actually was on antidepressants and saying that he was suicidal right up to the point where I filed for divorce the first time. And then suddenly he's all better and he's fine. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's the time then you're likely to be worse, not, better and then suddenly he's he's okay and he doesn't need the antidepressants anymore and I was just like what are you what is all this stuff you know why are you using mental health as an excuse to get away with you know the agenda that he has so I'm not sure how 
genuine the whole depression and and I'm pretty sure the suicidal stuff was not genuine. What do you think his agenda was? Based on something he said that he effectively wanted a maid, someone to cook and clean and to provide. He said um, that? Not not in as many words, but effectively, because I asked him when I filed for divorce the first time and I said, well, why don't you just go back to Africa where you got, you know, you can just have a maid, literally. Right. Uh, and um, he, I can't remember the exact wording he said, but it wasn't the same. It was something along like um, he didn't he didn't affirm me as that he wanted me personally. Um, he, he wanted he wanted the benefits that I bring. And that was what he said. And I don't know why I didn't pick up on it at the time to be as blunt as that. Because he, he was had a way with words to make me not right. see things right away. Um, but afterwards, when I thought about it, I was like, he, he just doesn't actually value me as a person. He just wants what I can bring for him. I think too many men want the benefits and privileges of marriage yep. without any of the responsibility that God gives them in the Bible. Right. Yeah. He would take uh, providing, like providing a roof over our heads and, you know, the, the financial side of it, he took that very seriously. But that was the only part that he was interested in. He wasn't interested in connecting in any way or providing for any other needs, emotional needs or anything. Um, it was like I provide a roof over your head. And at one point, I remember as well, um, he, he worked very long hours and stuff. And I mentioned maybe that wouldn't be the best job to stay in if for our marriage sake and that kind of thing, that maybe something with less, less hours or better hours would be better. And um, I can't remember exactly how I phrased it, but it was effectively that I could, he said I could leave, at least he would have a job and a roof over his head. And I remember thinking, so what he's concerned wow. about is actually the roof over his head <laughs> as much as anything, because I could just leave. That says a uh, lot. Yeah, yeah. Hey there, are you ready for a challenge? Because we have a big one for you. Leslie and I, along with her team, want to challenge those big beliefs that have been weighing you down. Many of them have probably found their way into your life from the pews of your local church. You know the ones I'm talking about. Beliefs like, you need to die to yourself to keep your marriage intact. Or how about this gem? Your husband's need for respect is more important than your need to be heard. And don't even get me started on God Hates Divorce. It's time to break up with these beliefs because they are not in the Bible. But don't take my word for it. Join us for a free workshop Leslie is offering on April 9th at noon or 7.30 Eastern. She's going to dive deep into what the Bible actually says on these topics. And if you have questions, she's going to answer them live. So go to leslievernick.com forward slash free training to register because this is a private event. Then mark your calendars, tell your friends, and get ready to break up with those old beliefs. It's time for a fresh start and it all starts with you. See you at the workshop. You hit a wall at one point where you finally realized, I can't take it anymore. Describe that moment or that time of your life. I had uh, got to the point in the early part of the summer where I was thinking this just isn't going to work. Um, but we'd had a conversation and we were just carrying on just a little bit longer. But it just didn't seem like it was right. I, I felt like something was off. And during that time, my son came up crying to me and saying that he that daddy had hit him in the face and I couldn't see any re any evidence of that but I was just like okay take note of this and when I addressed it later on he said that he'd been misbehaving and that he'd um threatened him with a stick um but he hadn't he said he hadn't actually hit him in the face um, that your son had threatened him with the stick no no no, no, no. My, my husband had threatened my son with the stick okay uh, because of misbehavior or something like that um I didn't take it any further because I thought, okay, maybe it was just a one-off incident and not, he didn't seem harmed, just obviously frightened just at, in the morning and that kind of thing. But I didn't have anything to base it on and anything to go on further than that. Then um, when we got back from about four weeks away visiting my parents, 
my son did something which children do at that sort of age. What, had, how old was he? He was just, just turned four. Yeah. And, Thank you. and he had basically peed in the bed and I had told him off. I said, you've got to go to the bathroom. You, you know, you can't just be in the bed, but I just gave him a timeout. I didn't hurt, hit him physically or anything like that. It was just like, we can't do this. Um, I told my husband what had happened because of course he would have heard a bit of a commotion. And he said that I was too lenient and that uh, my son's got me wrapped around his little finger and was basically accusing me of um, bad parenting and that kind of thing. And that I, I was just like, I'm gonna leave this room before I say things that I don't wanna say. So I went upstairs and while I was upstairs, my husband got a stick and um, basically hit our son um, multiple times, leaving marks on him. And the marks, like I didn't know what was happening. When I came downstairs, I heard my son crying and he said his, his hands hurt, his fingers hurt. And I was like, okay, you know, obviously something's happened, but I didn't know what. And I, it wasn't until I put my son in the bath a little bit later that I saw the marks on his bottom and um, there were, I took photos of it, which were then uh, basically social worker and the police involved and all that kind of thing. But I knew that if you, I- Did involved, you call the police? I didn't the first time because I knew if I did anything, that was the end of the marriage because I knew that um, he didn't forgive me for the time that I called the police the first time, which was a couple of years prior to that when I was just asking for advice. And he really held that against me. So I knew if I did something, this was the end of the marriage. And I was like, am I ready for this yet? Like, yeah. this is this is a big decision. Um, but the Conquer group, actually, I, I posted it in the group and I was just asking for advice. And so many of them said, you know, this is just one incident. This this could keep going. And this is your child and, and various things which just helped me to think clearly about what to do. And so even though I didn't feel ready in some ways, because I was still trying to have this mindset, I'll, I'll try and stay well, I'll try and stay well, even though it doesn't feel right. Um, I just felt like this was God's um, release in, in some ways, like this was the opening that God was giving me to be like, okay, let, let's move you out of this situation. And it was great because I could see God's evidence through it all, because I even had a Christian um, IDVA, which is an independent domestic violence advocate, and she was a Christian, and that's very unlikely over here in the UK, especially. It's not like um, as a, as Christian as the, the state is. And she was able to just talk scripture to me and, and help me through the process mm. uh, for the next few months. And we had a great social worker who was very supportive. And yeah, the church came alongside behind me. Initially, it was a little bit rocky. Um, in terms of how much support they gave right at the very beginning, but they came alongside and, and they really rallied to be my I'm family. So and I just feel so blessed because I've had so much support. And I know some people just don't have that, but I just feel God really just opened up the door for me to be able to walk out. You know, so many women that I talk to, and I talk to a lot, they're moment where they hit a wall and they finally leave is when it involves the children. Mm. And I get that. I'm a mom uh, and you mess with my kid and I don't care if I have to live on the street, I'm going to protect my kids. But ladies, protect yourself. You are God's child. You are as valuable as your children and if you're in these places, your safety matters to God and it should matter to yourself too. So please don't wait so long that it, it would even need to involve your children. And I'm not saying that you have to leave, but I am saying that you have a safety plan if one might be needed, um, whether that's verbally safe, you know, emotionally safe, spiritually safe, physically safe, your safety matters to God. Um, you, you mentioned the Conquer Group. At what point did you find Leslie? And what was that experience like? 
so I um, came across Leslie mainly through my sister. Um, my older sister did uh, biblical counseling and I would often talk to her about the situation and try and get um, advice on how to handle situations. And she handed me this book, um, which is The Emotionally Destructive Marriage. And we went through that checklist at the, at the front. And I, I can't remember if it's a score thing or just a checklist, but whatever it was, it ended up scoring very highly. And I'm like, it's a it's a wow. test in the beginning of her book uh, that and and you can get some of this I believe in our quick start guide, but uh, at the beginning of her book it's it's a test that you take and score to see if you're in an emotionally destructive marriage. Yeah, so I did that, and that really opened my eyes just to how bad it was for me because I was like so I was so used to minimizing it and to excusing his behavior and putting it down to culture or whatever it might be, but just to actually see it black and white, answer the questions was really helpful. And um, that helped me to get to the point where I was thinking differently about our interactions and seeing things differently. And after a little while, I, I've, I found out about the, um, the Conquer group and I was like, okay, it would be really helpful if I'm leaving <laughs> to be able to be part of this group to get the support that I need. And I joined at a time when I thought I was going to leave and then I actually stayed and I thought, okay, well, let's stay well. And I had access to all the videos and training to be able to, to um, see if I could stay well. The community where I could ask questions about certain things that were coming up and get outside perspective. And then when it came time obviously for this situation that I just mentioned to come up, I was able to put in the community group and to to get that advice when I needed it. Um, the only thing I would say is, as you said earlier, is to have a safety plan in place uh, or an idea of what you would do if you have to get out uh, in a rush, like if things changed very quickly, because I was not expecting what happened. Mm. I, I was very much in the frame of mind that things were just gonna carry ticking over as much as they had always done. Um, and not some big event like this to kind of catapult things forward in such a way that like social services, I was like, I don't know that I want social services involved. I mean, yeah, that's scary to me. That's very scary. And, you know, the, the police were involved and all these kinds of things. And I had, I had no idea about all of this. And this was all new territory and very, very scary. So I would probably look into, you know, what are the options if something should happen so that you're a little bit prepared for for that kind of situation if it should should happen because like I said I wasn't expecting it to happen and then it did and then I was really thrown off guard but to have been better prepared would have been would have been nice. Mm. What were some of the big aha moments in your learning with Conquer? I think one of the things that stood out to me was about boundaries and setting boundaries I am the kind of person that, you know, other people have said, you're just super nice. <laughs> and I think that's a compliment. I think that is a good thing. But the problem with that is that abusers can take advantage of that. Yes. And they can use that quality that is a good thing and turn it into something which can then be used against us. And I know that I bent over backwards to try and please him so that he would have all of the the benefits of a good marriage basically and and i was suffering um and at a sacrifice and a big loss through the marriage and i feel like if i had set boundaries better earlier on that maybe he wouldn't have been able to um do as much damage how mm. did you begin to apply that lesson specifically or the boundaries into your life so I think uh, some of the things that I did later on was uh, to, like if my family were visiting, I was going to make sure that I have family in America who were visiting in the UK, I was going to spend time with them. And even though he was making it difficult for me and was um, yeah, making me feel guilty in some ways or trying to, I was like, no, I'm not going to feel guilty about this. My family are here. I'm going to spend time with them. And if I have to pay for it later, then I have to pay for it later. But, you know, I was going to be like, I'm making this time to, to be with my family. Or, you know, if I, you know, just day-to-day -day life at home, um, if he was treating me badly, uh, then I wouldn't spend the rest of my time with him. I would remove myself and I would just go and do my own thing somewhere else and that kind of thing. So it was a case of just 
yeah, taking care of myself and, and being aware that actually the needs that I have, such as seeing my family or to be away from a negative environment were really important to my own well-being. They are, they, and, and those needs are important and they do matter. Um, and how did he respond as you began to implement these things? He would kick up a fuss. Um, so for example, if I was gonna say like, I'm taking the car and I'm gonna go see my family, he would rub it in as to how inconvenient I was making it for him and how bad I was being to him because I was doing this this thing. Um, we only had one car between us. So um, it meant that he had to get a bus or a taxi into work or something like that. So he had means to to carry on doing what he needed to do while I did my thing. And yeah, so he, he would rub it in and make me make me feel bad. But I would say, okay, that, that's your problem. <laughs> um, because I have not asked for much. And when my family are around, I want to be able to see them. How are you different today, Marie? Uh, I know you went through a difficult divorce after 11 years of marriage. You're now living the life of a single mom, which is not an easy life, especially when it comes to finances. Uh, how are you different today and how are you doing? I would say I'm doing really well now. Um, the first couple of years after we separated, well, certainly the first year was pretty awful. Um, that was when I found out just the extent of the lies um, and then certain other things happened as well that kind of just reinforced this lack of trust in people. Um, mm. And I was very, very emotional. Like I, it would be rare for me to go to church and not be crying <laughs> and that kind of thing. So it, it was very raw. But I felt like if I'm going to get through this well, then I need to tackle this head on. Like don't bury it away, you know, actually deal with the emotions. Let let feel those emotions, let them be, um, and work through them as best I can with um, God's word and counselors and whatever else I needed to, to have around me. And I feel like by doing that, I really pushed through a lot of the healing process that I needed to do. But I mean, you can't rush the process. It, it, it is something that, you know, comes no. and goes. And some days you're going to be great. Some days you're just going to be right back where you were before. And then eventually those good days become more and more consistent and you suddenly realize actually I'm doing so much better and you, I, I found that when the divorce went through it was like this weight lifted and it's like okay now I'm ready to face the future I feel like um, I've used that two years to rediscover who I am um, to think back as to who I was before we I got married and who do I want to be moving forward and kind of start really thinking about what that looks like and being very intentional about even though I wasn't looking for another person. I, I remember writing a list like I don't want to be tempted by mm -hmm. somebody who just seems really nice and wants to come and rescue me because life is difficult right now. So I'm going to write a list of my non-negotiables and be like if um, someone were to come into my life, they would have to look like this. Um, and that was really helpful as well because, you know, although it wasn't an issue, I knew that I was vulnerable and yes. I knew that I had made decisions the first time based on financial security and other things where I was feeling vulnerable at the time when I got married the first time. I did not want to do the same thing again. So I was really intentional about setting those boundaries and thinking, OK, this is where it's going to be. And move forward on that and I feel like now I'm in a, a really good place I am doing I'm doing well I feel like I know who I am I feel like I know what God has called me to do and I'm pursuing that and um, I feel like my connections I got good connections with my friends and family so everything's just started to come together and I feel like I'm moving into this new chapter feeling um, a lot more confident what are you getting ready to do? I started uh, online business while I was married with the idea that I would be able to pay my own debts off and eventually thinking that I might actually need this to support myself. So I learned a lot about online marketing and online courses, memberships, business and all of that kind of thing. And I am now preparing to set up an opportunity for helping other people like myself who are 
single Christian women. Um, in my mind, they've gone through difficult circumstances, whether it's abuse, cheating or whatever. And being able to provide an opportunity for them to um, work from home, stay home with their kids, because that was important to me. I wanted to homeschool. I wanted to be at home with my son. And I did not want my husband's, um, the, the way he treated us and the situation that we were in to stop me from pursuing that goal. Mm. So I wanted to find a way to work from home. And and that's basically what I'm wanting to be able to do and help others do the same. That's amazing. What would you say to the woman listening right now who's in a similar situation as you were, a painful situation, what would you say to her? I would say don't minimize your experience. Our feelings are like the lights on the dashboard. They're telling us when something is wrong. And we need to look at what those warning signs are, are telling us. And I would definitely get advice from people that you trust to maybe have an outside perspective if you can. Um, the Conquer Group is a great way to, to do that from people who actually understand abuse because people who haven't never experienced that may not necessarily give the right advice. True. But um, I think some that's what was helpful for me was I would share my situation with my family and um, especially my sister and she would be able to give me some ways to handle it and things like that, but not to um, to shove it aside and be like, oh, well, it's not that bad. It's not as bad as so-and-so and whatever, but to really take it as this is a situation, what is the best way that I can move forward in this situation as it is now? How? What are some ways that I can actually improve the situation? And if it does not improve, what am I going to do about it next? Um, so it's to, to, to look at what the st next steps are, regardless of which way that it should go. Hmm. Is there anything else that you want to add? Like I said, one, one of the things I've got is this tattoo, Jeremiah 29 11. And I think too often we are looking for validation and support from support groups, family, friends, that kind of thing, but we don't necessarily go to God's word. And I think this is something that I wish I had done more of. I did do, but I wish I had done more of is to actually look at all the ways in which God shows his love in God's word and how he really nurtures us and provides for us in our situation. Um, because we can be trying to fix things ourselves in some ways and not letting necessarily God work in and through us. And I feel like my marriage was like a desert experience where, or the wilderness experience where you're going out is, is pretty bad. Um, but we're growing through that. Whether it's Jesus who went out into the desert into the wilderness for 40 days paul before his ministry went out into the wilderness the israelites were out in the wilderness for 40 years there's that wilderness period where you get to to grow and even though mm. things might be really difficult um and it feels like where is god maybe that to use that wilderness time to really deepen the relationship with god and to really be fed by him and to not be dependent on your spouse but to be dependent on God and to let him feed you and then to prepare you for whatever is next. And if that's staying well, to prepare you for that. If it's preparing to leave, to do something else, to prepare you for that um, so that you're not doing it in your own strength, but really with God's strength. That is so good, Marie. And I think really that describes conquer in a way because it's so many women that are in that wilderness time and we just want to come alongside and help you to grow in your relationship with God and to be strengthened and to know that he cares for you and loves you. And uh, so we hope to be able to do that with more and more ladies who need it. So thank you. I really appreciate you being here and sharing your incredible story. And I'm excited about your future and your business you. and, and all the things that are good in your life now. So take care of yourself, yeah. Marie. Thank you very much. And I'm going to come visit England. Yes, do. <laughs> I'm going to. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening today. Friend, we have so much more to share with you. Please do yourself a favor and go to leslievernick.com forward slash free training to reserve your spot for Leslie's free workshop coming up on April 9th.
It's time to say goodbye to old beliefs and hello to a brighter, more empowered future. Don't miss out on this opportunity to take your first step towards real change. Ready to register? Just head over to lesliebernick.com forward slash free training and secure your spot today. Until next time, may God bless all of your relationships with him, with yourself, and with others.